friends, on behalf of Center for the Study of Developing Societies, I would like to welcome you all for 21st BM Dangli Memorial Chair. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Laila Abul who has kindly agreed to deliver today's BM Dangli Memorial Chair. Dangli Memorial Lecture is instituted in the memory of Professor BM Dangli, who was a very distinguished economist. He was also the first chairman of the governing board of CSDS. He also served as the vice chancellor of Delhi University. There is a long list. Today is the 21st lecture. We have been holding this lecture every year. There is a long list of speakers who have delivered this lecture in the past. I don't want to take name of each and every speaker, but just to name few speakers in the past. Uh, Charles Taylor, Kupare, John Key, Amit Padri, uh, uh, Professor Agamben, Pina Agapal, Dr. Chakraji, Deepesh Chakraborty, and you can imagine that there is a list of 21 speakers who have delivered in the past. Last year, the DN Gangli Memorial Lecture was delivered by Ina Gandhi. And in the series today, we have Professor Duarte, who is a professor of social sciences at Columbia University, <coughs> where she teaches anthropology and gender studies. She is a leading voice in the debate about culture, gender, Islam, and global feminist politics. Today, she would be speaking on gender, violence, security, circuits of power, and the Muslim question. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Shail Mayara, who is a professor at CSDH. She would be chairing today's lecture, so I would like to invite her to introduce the speaker and take the proceedings forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, it's a truly happy moment uh, to have Laila Abulgo deliver the BN Kamguli Memorial Lecture as we celebrate the life of Professor BN Kamguli. Uh, as I just pointed out, it's a well-known economist um, and chair of our board of governors. Uh, I want to introduce Laila uh, with a personal note. Uh, although we have never met uh, till now, I have known of her for some decades, largely through a connect with her family. Uh, she comes from a celebrated academic family and indeed refers to herself as, as a Hafi. Uh, her mother, Janet Abulgod, who was Jewish American, uh, pioneered, as we know, the idea that the modern world system began in 1250, uh, much before you know, European hegemony. Uh, and her work, uh, Cairo, 1000 Years of the City Victorious, is something uh, that I have found inspiration, inspiration and uh, Narayani was just mentioning that she has drawn upon it as well. Uh, and it is not coincident, uh, coincidental that Egypt also became the ethnographic locale for Lila's work on the Bedouin. Her father, Ibrahim Abulugod, uh, was a towering Palestinian Arab uh, Muslim intellectual. And I often remember his words about Tel Aviv, Jaffa, uh, which is uh, a 4,000 year old city, Jaffa, that the old Jaffa comes alive for him when he is swimming in the sea. Uh, and it is significant that Leila would write a book on Nakba, uh, the partition of Palestine. While Leila carried the baton, the academic baton, her sister, whom I knew as Mekla, became the rebel. I first met Mekla when she came to meet my mother. This strikingly beautiful young woman had become a Meera Dasi at the Govindev Temple in Jaipur. She wore a Rajasthani lehenga skirt only, spoke flawless Hindi, and would often dance in the evenings at the temple. Subsequently, she became a Kathak dancer, also danced as flamenco, and eventually did, uh, did her PhD on dance and returned to academia. Uh, Laila's veiled sentiments, which explores the life worlds of Bedouin through, the, of the Bedouin through their poetry, has a particularly moving uh, afterword. This is in the 2016 edition. This was written 30 years after the publication of the book, and she revisits uh, chapter one of the book called 
and, which, and the after one is called The Guest and the Daughter Revisited. Laila had uh, returned to Egypt in 2008 as the towering figure known as the Hajj, the last of the Aulad Ali Bedouin tribe to keep camel herds was critically ill. He was both teacher and second father to her. And she had had a dream about him in New York, a kind of ominous dream which is what brought her back to his home. The Hajj <coughs> hears that she has come and insists that he be sent home from hospital. As she is leaving, he tells his son to give the daughter money. Leila writes of him fumbling for the wallet, which was not there, and her pain at seeing his masculine dignity compromised. There was not only no wallet, as she writes, but he had no control over anything and how she, she feels protected and loved and loving in that moment. There is surely the ambivalence of gender in this relationship. He is a grand patriarch, judge and mediator, but the one who also told her stories, taught her history and poetry and explained Bedouin life worlds. She writes of their bond as Ishra, living together of sharing times and finds herself praying for the Hajj's recovery. She uses this concept, the concept of Ishra, to critique Bourdieu's conception of social science as involving the sovereign perspective and the ethnographer as being outside and beyond. Naya also theorizes uh, in this afterward the idea of ethnographic reserve and ethnographic restraint that she uses to counter Sherry Ortner's idea of ethnographic refusal and makes the point that people shared with her accounts of love and betrayal and sometimes marital disputes that often cannot be made public and that the vulnerability of communities must be considered. Laila has also worked on television dramas. There are many here at CSDS among my colleagues. Uh, you will find uh, uh, later who have an interest in media, in nationalism, in democracy. Her more recent work has involved a shift to public ethnography. And particularly after uh, 11 September 2011, where she's been concerned about the representation of Arabs and Muslims and hence her book, uh, Muslim Women Need Saving, Laila Abul Ghul. Thank you so much. Uh, I've never had an introduction like that. Uh, I was crying, uh, thinking about that. And it was so personal, uh, and I, I'll just say thank you for doing that, uh, for the generous introduction. And thank you all for coming out in this air uh, to be here. Uh, it was really such an honor to be invited to give this uh, lecture in this distinguished series. Uh, and a thrill, finally, uh, to see for myself this world-famous center uh, for the study of developing societies where so many of the influential Indian thinkers we read and think with in my circles have been based. And this is my first time in Delhi, uh, which, like the rest of India, is so much part of my imagination and my intellectual formation, although uh, you've just heard that I have a personal connection to, to Jaipur through my sister and uh, where my niece and nephew were born. And it's been amazing to walk around and think this is where they come from. So um, it's just so moving. But my intellectual connection to uh, South Asia started in 1988 when I was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the University of Pennsylvania when Arjun Padurai and Carol Breckenridge were just beginning the project on public culture. And I decided I would, my only responsibility as a fellow was to find interesting things to participate in at the University of Pennsylvania. And so I decided to attend regularly the South Asia seminar. 
that year since they and uh, Peter Vanderveer were running it. And it was by far the most exciting intellectual space on campus for someone like me because the theme for the year's seminar was Orientalism and Beyond. And in my own field of Middle East studies, the whole of Zionism and the general anti-Arab sentiment was so strong among the older generation that it was still pretty hard to work on these themes, even to mention Edward Said's work. They called it the O word. Uh, but in a seminar at Penn, uh, I was introduced to the work of South Asianists who were run with his ideas and they had even better ideas than he had. Uh, they were taking on colonial knowledge. Uh, they were taking it up, taking it to task. They were rethinking so much of South Asian history. Some alternate studies was flourishing. I was introduced to Gyan Prakash, Latamani, Nicholas Dirk, Ashish Nandi, who I still remember. Uh, uh, it's associated with you. I still remember he provoked uh, an apoplectic Peter Gaffney <laughs> to stand up on his chair and shout at him at, after his lecture. So this is somebody from outside the field going, oh, this is interesting. Um, but, and many others. And this experience really inspired me to um, organize in the years following with uh, Timothy Mitchell a project to bring together South Asian and Middle East scholars um, and around what we call the questions of modernity or uh, post-Orientalist scholarship is the way we thought about it. And our first meeting was in Cairo in 1993. Uh, and the workshops and seminars went on for almost a decade and involved amazing scholars, uh, most of you, most, many of whom uh, you know. Uh, and my thinking about the scholarship on the Middle East and the wider Muslim world was opened up by my exposure to these scholars and these debates that were going on in South Asian studies. And there are actually some continuities, I realized, between that project um, and the one that I've been involved with for the last three years or so, a collaborative project um, that I want to talk to you about today. And I I hope it's not going to be too long, but bear with me uh, if it is. Uh, and this too brought together South Asia and uh, the Middle East. And in this case, it was feminist scholars thinking about one thorny issue, which was gender violence. So I'm going to be sharing with you today, for the very first time, the preliminary work that we've done to frame the book uh, that we're now pulling together out of this project. And our project began with the observation that over the last few decades, violence against women, that's one of my colleagues called it Val, I don't know what you call it Val, and subsequently gender-based violence, GBV, uh, as it's known, had emerged as powerful master categories in agendas of international governance and international law. And they were increasingly, uh, but very selectively, being folded into practices of state sovereignty and global security. So I'm a long way from my Bedouin research. Uh, so what had once been marginalized feminist concerns about the gravity of violence against women or gender-based violence with a broader term and the silences surrounding these matters, important concerns that took tremendous efforts by feminist activists to bring to public consciousness now appear to sit firmly at the nexus of powerful global networks of institutions and practices that have recast development and humanitarianism in line with post-9-11 global security regimes. And in popular consciousness and media, they've also emerged as serious problems that demand solutions, and we know that very well here. So what I want to do today is outline for you uh, the questions that have guided our group's explorations of this striking development as we sought to understand how a visionary and courageous feminist cause to combat gender violence has become so implicated in global, national, and local systems of power. Our collaborative project um, was carried out under a name which we don't actually accept anymore. Uh, it was called Religion and the Global Framing of Gender Violence. And I want to credit right away my close colleagues, Professor Nader Ashanhub Kavorkian and Rima Hamami, uh, for what I'll be presenting. Uh, we're writing the introduction to, to the book together, and um, 
I acknowledge that a lot of the framing and even some of the specific language of my lecture comes from our discussions and even from them. So they've read it, they approve, uh, and I'll go ahead. So as we begin to pull together the findings uh, to write the introduction to this book that uh, I think collects together some brilliant papers that were presented by a group of feminist scholars. We brought together scholars who worked on, on and in Bangladesh, Palestine, India, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Egypt, Tanzania, and even the United States and the International Criminal Court. We found ourselves thinking hard about what you might call the politics and the geographies of the agenda to com combat gendered violence. And our questions were not so much about the success or failure of these efforts, since there aren't any simple answers or measures. Instead, our questions are about the modes and channels of their operation. How is the emerging consensus, conviction even, that gendered violence is a serious problem being worked out on the ground in specific sorts of practices, in different places, and under different social and political conditions? How is it, as my title suggests, actually nobody mentioned the title, but I think it says this, um, how is it differentially connected to various circuits of power? What can we learn about the actual social and political effects of this convergence on the wrongness, the moral and the legal wrongness of sexual and gender violence? This convergence, I think we can see in everything from attempts at national legal reforms to annual rituals like UN Women's 16 Days Against Violence Against Women, from war crime tribunals at the International Criminal Court to the priorities of the work of NGOs and locally based organizations as these trickle down from governmental and intergovernmental agencies. What figures? in both senses of the word, numbers and images circulate among these institutions, animating and justifying their work. There's child marriage, there's domestic violence, there are categories deemed harmful traditional practices, there are so-called honor killings, which even made a cameo appearance in President Trump's so-called Muslim ban. Where do these place individuals and groups who are subjects of violence? Who and what do these efforts in power, and who and what do they marginalize? These are complex questions, and you'll have to read the book to find the answers, and before that, we're going to have to write the book. But in the meantime, uh, let me talk about the directions of our thinking, uh, the directions it's taking. Um, because most of us in this project uh, worked in one way or another in Muslim communities, or where Muslims were perceived as a problem, because we focused on the Middle East and South Asia, when we began the project, we thought we would be investigating the role of religion in naming, framing, and governing gender violence. But we were also interested in comparative questions about the forms and politics of inquiry, techniques of measurement, and technologies of intervention that are currently <coughs> being used to frame and treat the issue. We wanted to examine why and how global and national governments might be using the violence against women or gender-based violence to advance political agendas. We hope to map patterns, paying particular attention to what falls under the rubric of these master categories, but equally, urgently, what falls out. And my Palestinian colleague, Nandra Shafouk uh, Kevorkian, by necessity both a scholar and an activist, kept reminding us to keep asking, who pays a price and who benefits from the specific ways violence against women or gender-based violence are framed. And after our first uh, planning meeting in um, New York, we developed a concept paper, as one does, uh, that we thought would give direction to the work that we were going to do. And we articulated it at that time in terms of three conceptual domains. The first was narratives and framing of violence against women what should I call it? B-A-W-G-B-V, is that good enough? Uh, what narratives, what discursive frames are used to make this an object of public and, uh, and policy concern across different geopolitical contexts? How do aspects of social life become labeled this? Uh, and in what ways are these made visible through processes of naming, processes of naming and framing? Um, what gets highlighted, highlighted what, what gets hidden? by the way uh, we frame these 
problems. The second conceptual, so that was the sort of narrative side. Uh, the second conceptual domain was what we call governance and resource distribution. How are violence against women, GBV, agendas implicated in contemporary practices of global governance and regimes of governmentality? And how do these play out at the national and local levels? What are the institutional and political circuits and networks through which they gain power and travel at global and local agendas? What are the material underpinnings of the rise of these agendas? What kinds of technical intermediation and expertise are involved and produced through these flows and processes? Um, and it, and uh, well, maybe I'll skip ahead. Um, and the third conceptual domain, so with narratives, governance, and distribution, the third conceptual domain was what we then thought of as alternative trajectories and experiences, and I have to say we didn't end up doing much with this, but we were all either ethnographers or socio-legal scholars. We all had real-world, on-the-ground experiences <coughs> in communities about which we were writing. Uh, was there a way to emphasize? how anti-violence interventions were viewed from the perspective of situated communities or forms of activism that may have emerged outside of or at odds with the global frameworks and prescriptions. Could we learn from individual uh, community or activist experiences in negotiating violence and its various intersections with gender that might shed light on some of the antimonies and blind spots of the global agenda. In other words, we hope to explore what alternative spaces and narrative frames for collective anti-violence <coughs> activism might exist beyond or in tension with the formulas of the global agendas. Uh, this was pretty ambitious, uh, three con conceptual domains. But as we began to um, share our research papers, we became obsessed with something else. Uh, we became obsessed with analyzing the political and institutional circuits that gender-based violence or violence against women seem to inhabit, animate, traverse, or consolidate. And given the regions uh, in which we all worked, and now the setting here, uh, I, I want to focus especially on what we discovered about the politics of the Muslim question, as you call it here, in these circuits. Uh, to give an example, I'll tell you a bit more about this surprising topic that I ended up exploring as a consequence of being involved in this, uh, with this group, uh, very far from the kind of ethnographic work I did in the past. Um, all of it had been in Egypt. Uh, so I ended up writing about the recent turn by Euro-American and even some transnational and regional women's rights advocates to securing a place for themselves in the booming field of what goes under the trademark of CBE, or countering violent extremism. But let me backtrack uh, to give the broader context. At the time of the US invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, all know very well, the harnessing of violence against women to legitimate a project of imperial military intervention in the name of humanitarianism seemed like a kind of exceptional and obvious instrument, uh, instance of political instrumentalization. Instrumentalism. The focus on the Taliban atrocities against Afghan women justified intervention by purporting to save Afghan and by extension Muslim women. And I first wrote about that in an article that probably many of you know that's turned out to be very useful for teaching, um, uh, published in 2002. And actually, it was originally given at a teach-in uh, with Guy Andrews feedback uh, uh, on a forum against a forum on war that we had at Columbia. I don't know, were you guys there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm happy it turned out to be useful. It was called, Do Muslim Women Really Need Saving? And this article actually became the starting point for a whole book uh, that I worked on for the next decade, I'm embarrassed to say, looking more broadly at what I call the circulation of the social or social life of Muslim women's rights. Um, but let's go back to this gender justification uh, for the invasion of Afghanistan. I think that 20 subsequent years have shown that violence against women, GBV, entanglement with imperial geopolitics, 
has actually become the ongoing global order of things. Concerns about gender violence have circulated into ever-expanding arenas, while the language of the WGBV has become linked to some of the key political projects of our times. And there's probably no better evidence uh, of the success of what had begun as a radical feminist effort to produce a global consensus around the wrongs of gender-based violence than the award winners of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Nadia Murad and Dr. Dennis Mukwege, both of whom were commended for campaigning against rape and sexual assault as a weapon of war. Murad was then a 25-year-old Yazidi woman who was abducted and then escaped what is now described as sexual slavery by Daesh or ISIS in northern Iraq. And her co-winner, Dr. Dennis Mukwege, was a physician who for decades had been treating sexual assault victims in his war-torn country, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the award appears to condense a momentous and positive shift in public consciousness and attitudes in the international sphere, Nadia Murad's experience with the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria triggered yet another Security Council resolution against rape and sexual violence and conflict, and there have been many of these. The 2019 resolution was compromised, not surprisingly, by U.S. opposition to it, um, given our current administration, but Nadia Murad's lawyer, Amal Clooney, representing all the survivors of this minority religious group, argued passionately for the resolution, and she said it offered the Security Council the chance to stand on the right side of history. She called it the Nuremberg moment. The awarding of the Nobel Prize to these two figures captures perfectly the paradoxes that we're struggling with regarding the feminist achievement of making gender-based violence a serious matter of international concern. Both the sexual and genocidal violence against the Yazidis in Iraq by Muslim militants and the luridly publicized sexual violence of the conflict in the DRC, casually dumped by the media, the rape capital of the world, produce horror and pity for the victims. Horror at the perpetrators, pity for the victims. Even as the prize recognizes the personal and political courage of these activists confronting or helping women subjected to specific forms of violence and injury, it firmly locates the savagery of the violators among racialized and distant perpetrators. Women are presented as victims who are, whose violated and injured bodies are in need of protection, if necessary, by militarized intervention, which is happening with the peacekeeping forces in the Congo, and obviously uh, things are happening in the Middle East, um, even though we know that militarization inevitably creates conditions for greater violence against women, among other people. Humanitarian efforts thus emanate from the comfortable Western powers who present themselves as innocent of any role in producing or sustaining the violent conflicts that are contributing to these specific incidents of gender violence. Even the most cursory historical analysis of the conflicts in Iraq and in Syria, or the Congo for that matter, of course, suggests that these claims to innocence are unwarranted. Think of colonial history. In other words, commendable as may be the consciousness about the devastating violence this prize affirms and the mobilization it could inspire about plights of victims, we need to ask awkward questions about the selective ways this a visionary feminist project is being folded into world affairs. Is it because of the hard work of feminists that such violence generates such widespread <coughs> condemnation? Or because of the ways this condemnation dovetails with geopolitical interests, making some kinds of violence, some victims, and some perpetrators more worthy than others of attention, positive or negative? In the same way that my book interrogated the social life of Muslim women's rights, we want to ask about the social life of battles against GBV or BAW, not just taking for granted that they are moral and political battles that everyone of conscience should join. What we're proposing is that we need to track how, both how and why gender violence has come to run through <coughs> Security Council resolutions, humanitarian interventions, military interventions for regime change, proxy conflicts, cybersecurity networks, state repression of their own 
populations, and as first Afghanistan, and then the Murad case indicate the so-called global war on terror. The fact that the cause is worthy does not mean that we should turn a blind eye to the larger geopolitics that propel the funding, employment opportunities, and knowledge and policy production that accompany these efforts to protect women brutalized. We need to ask sober questions about the boons of this agenda to international expert helpers, journalists, arms dealers, security agents, contractors, politicians, military personnel, therapists, Democrats, and democracy experts, among others. Some crumbs even trickle down to the local NGOs promoting women's human rights and well-being, or the humanitarian refugee and asylum industry. We also shouldn't lose sight of what the agenda is doing to the violated survivors of gender-based violence, from making them further targets of violence to damaging their dignity and precious social ties, distorting their views, sensationalizing their situations, or forcing them to relive what they might rather leave behind. As the research that we brought together for this project has made clear to us, um, the, what do I call it, the GBV, let's call it GBV, has become integral to exclusionary technologies of ever thickening border regimes. It serves as an indicator for potential terrorist threat, and thus a trigger for anti-terrorist activity. It works to suppress and colonize through criminalizing dominated public <coughs> populations and is now being taken as uh, most recently as a harbinger of collapse into failed states warranting outside intervention. It has thus become a central player in political projects of racial and religious profiling, directing excessive attention to some perpetrators of violence while completely erasing others. It lies fully nested within the rhetorics and mobilizations of resurgent populism, especially in anti-Muslim rhetoric, whether across Europe, in Trump's America, or dare I say, Modi's India. It has become an instrument through which the international system confers or denies civilizational membership to individuals, to movements, and even the whole nation states. So I think GBV can no longer be seen simply as a global feminist project. These terms now constitute master categories that are integral to and at the service of a variety of political and geopolitical projects. So our, pro our argument, in other words, is that in many contexts, these master categories may sequester from view the actualities and lived experiences of violence in the contemporary world, including of gender violence itself. They often evict from the frame imperial complicity in the production of the very violences they claim to prevent, <coughs> mitigate, or eradicate. So our contention is, in fact, is that the multiplicities and complex formations of gender violence across varying contexts, as well as the varying causes and perpetrators, sorry for the long sentences, I shouldn't have written this, uh, may be more often obscured than illuminated through the operations of power of these master categories. So uh, the goal of our collective research and discussions has been to interrogate these discursive framings and to consider how they work with practices, with networks, uh, and shifting dynamics of power. And we're tracking carefully the mobilizations of GBV, the apparatuses of which these categories have become a part, and the networks along which the constructs travel. Um, and we think that that's going to do more to help us understand something about gender and violence. It actually exposes key features of the intersecting political orders and uneven force fields of our current world. Uh, and that's a strong claim, and I'm making it because I'm at this major center where you think about the big questions about politics. Um, so that's our central question now, okay? What, 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 is, what is political order of the world? So to articulate our concerns about the politics and the political geographies of the master, this master category of GBV, we're now reimagining our work to address three big questions about the social and political lives of gender violence. And this is um, a rearrangement of what we began with in the concept paper that I mentioned earlier. 
Um, so first, uh, we want to know how the master categories of GBV, BAW travel. What are the channels, what are the paths and means? One could think of this as their political ecologies. Second, ask what this category of gender violence as object of knowledge and as deployed in social interventions, what it produces in the world. And we're considering a range of phenomena, including political alliances and institutional structures, legal reforms and social movements, women's NGOs and social media, refugee detention and human rights claims, discursive frames and economic sanctions. And third, we're asking, as we have all along, how these narrative frames and modes of visibilizing gender violence are defining and confining our fields of vision. How do they occlude? How do they sideline? How do they mask both powers and forces that inflict violence and the ways violence is experienced by those who suffer harm? So to understand the way uh, the way violence works in a global governance of the intimate, the ways it enforces global and local inequalities, our primary methodological strategy has been first to follow the multiple circuits of power in which GBV is entangled, and second to look at the political baggage of regional and global politics and conflicts that, bur that burden the categories. Um, what happens to our assessment of the feminist agenda to combat gender violence if we're forced to recognize that gender violence lies at the center of multiple global political and economic arrangements, temporalities, dynamics of governance, be they imperial, colonial, settler, colonial, or racial. We're not just going to talk about patriarchy, certainly not about bad men, or even about, the reli about religions that produce bad men. Islam is the usual suspect. We're going to talk about power politics and forms of governmentality. And by the latter, we mean every form of managing populations, from bureaucratic or colonial administration to policing and surveillance. So uh, one set of, uh, there's three parts uh, to the book. One set of contributions examines the co-implication of gender violence and religion in the dominant political formation of the contemporary global security <coughs> world order. And this is launched as part of the war on terror after 9-11. And the grip and the reach of this ideological and militarized uh, governance and surveillance formation have expanded dramatically, I think we know that, over the last couple of decades. Increasingly, deference to the ideology of extending international security regimes is urgent, is forced by the rhetoric of expanding terrorist threat and this has cemented global alliances among powerful and pliant nations from the US and France to Pakistan and Kenya, escalating fears, proliferating measures and institutions of counterterrorism, and converging quite dramatically in the past decade on the unquestioned compulsion that we must counter what now goes uh, under the charged and still undefined term violent extremism. How are feminist projects and gender-based violence implicated <coughs> in these politics? I think the Nadia Murad Yazidi case provides a good example of the way a terrible case of violence was taken up to legitimate the prevailing preoccupation with the sort of threat that is driving the explosive counterterrorism industry, justifying all manner of surveillance and intervention in global world war on terror. Um, right. that. Uh, this helps, um, so uh, I think uh, this helps put into perspective, uh, sorry, I'm just realizing it's going to be long, so I want to get to the various points. Uh, but this helps put into perspective and provide context for the way Nadia Murad was singled out for care and acclaim balancing appreciation of the feminist achievement this prize affirms against the dangers inherent in the way it consolidates a tight rhetorical nexus between gender and religion with sexual violence defining something called extremism and by association Muslims. Uh, the award built on and reproduced certain common sense ideas about the convergences between religion and gender violence, 
thickening the circuits of globalized securitization and further criminalizing or legitimizing the criminalization of Muslim men. And an earlier Nobel Prize uh, award had already laid the groundwork for this story of individual feminine victimhood, as you recall, Malala Yousafzai, was also a victim of violence shot by two Taliban men in Pakistan, allegedly for promoting Muslim girls' education at a time when <coughs> empowering girls, branded as Nike's neoliberal girl effect, was being pushed as the solution to global poverty. And an open letter, very interesting, from the Taliban, a Taliban uh, man in prison explained that though deplorable, the young man, uh, he didn't agree with the shooting, uh, the young man had shot Malala because she'd been smearing and spreading lies about the Taliban in the BBC reports she'd been writing since she was 12, not because she supported girls' education. And we do know that mass education for girls has been commonplace in Pakistan uh, for at least a century, half a century. And longer here. Similarly, Nadia Murad had been subjected to ugly sexual violence perpetrated by a new militant Islamist group, but no one mentioned that the emergence of both the Taliban and ISIS are directly tied to the failings and blowback of US interventions, first in Afghanistan and then in Iraq, to get rid of differently undesirable secular regimes in those two countries. And no one seemed to be listening to the findings of anthropologists and researchers who've spoken with the Yazidi women in the refugee camps and who've analyzed the differences in between their representations in the Western media and their own statements and voices, they don't think the uh, individual sexual violence is the primary problem. It's the genocide, they say, of their community. So why aren't these voices heard? Why are these facts of political history kept out of the picture? The chapters in our book that explore the circuit this circuit of security include mine, which I'll talk about uh, maybe in a few minutes and at great length uh, tomorrow at my lecture at JNU. Um, includes mine and several others, including um, brilliant analysis by the legal scholar Basuki Nassai, excuse me, Nassaya, of the unthinking French feminist celebration of the international criminal courts, charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity against Mr. Al Hassan Mahmoud of Timbuktu, Mali. The charges against this figure from a militant Islamist group were novel. Persecution of the population on the grounds of religion and on the grounds of gender. This is a new combination that officially links gender violence and religious extremism in a context in which the French had actually sent bombers, if I'm not mistaken. Another chapter in this section by Lenny Volk uh, legal uh, scholar analyzes the strange inclusion in Trump, Trump's executive <coughs> orders banning entry by foreign nationals from seven Muslim countries <coughs> of a cultural category that has become what she characterizes a dog whistle for right-wing Islamophobic Americans, the so-called honor killing, which of course has no known connection to terrorism. The second section of the book will include studies that shift the focus um, to the role of states and political parties in facilitating and even perpetrating the gendered violence that women and men experience. This is violence often hidden by the focus of GBV on either universalist arguments about patriarchy or culturalist arguments about misogynist religions. This is an arena in which governance feminists have not made the same inroads that they have in institutional, uh, in international institutions, <coughs> such as the International Criminal Court or the organs of the UN that deal with gender violence in other places. The gender violence here is directed towards citizens, colonial subjects, or minorities within nation states. While recognizing the ways nation states are inevitably shaped by international power politics, in these chapters on Israeli violent harassment of Palestinian schoolgirls in occupied East Jerusalem, the meaning for women political prisoners in Iran of the threat of rape in the context of torture in prison, the collusion of religious and political authorities and blaming traditional culture for the murder of a provocative social media star in Pakistan, and the state-sanctioned communalism that enables the lynching of Muslim men in India today are contributors' focus on the gendered violence <coughs> inflicted by 
or in the service of state regimes, whether in political projects of Islamization, authoritarian <coughs> repression of political dissent, inter internal colonialism, racialization, divisive communalism and populism, or in the jumping for power among factions of ruling elites. If Muslims are criminalized in the global sphere as perpetrators of religiously motivated gender violence in the security regime, for example, what often goes unremarked and unpunished, invisibilized, as she would say, are forms of what Nadra Shalvorkian calls state criminality, and others point out are its culpability for deadly sexual and gender violence. That's the second. The third global power formation in which we observe the master categories of violence against women, gender-based violence operating actively is humanitarianism, that which claims to be above politics, moral, humane, and based on care. The humanitarian is there only to mitigate the damage to people and communities by war and conflict. Looking at the catastrophe in Gaza, at queer and trans Iranian refugees languishing in Turkey, or it attempts to protect girls from child marriage or forced marriage in places like Bangladesh, we find the feminist agenda to combat GBV as part of humanitarian governance having some disturbing effects. Sometimes the master categories obfuscate or put off limits the problems voiced by the subjects of humanitarian care. The anti-GBV agenda generally silences the larger structural, <coughs> political, economic causes of individuals' miseries, especially when the states whose permission humanitarian organizations need in order to function are themselves the direct causes of the immiseration and dispossession of these people, uh, and arguably the main inflictors of the violence that harms them, as the case for Israel and Gaza, as my <coughs> colleague Rima Hamani has written. Uh, for this book. And finally, the inclusion of this international feminist agenda into humanitarian care can end up redirecting, if not deforming, the previously more expansive political work of local feminist activists. The humanitarian apparatus now limits almost all interventions for women to human rights trainings for women and girls to recognize domestic violence. No jobs are provided, no soap, and no political critique of the wars and powerful national interests that are making their lives unlivable and forcing them into inhuman conditions of refugee camps or places under siege, forbidden from moving freely or crossing borders. I'd love to share more about our project, but there isn't time for that. But those are the three pieces. Um, and do I have time to talk a little bit about mine before we're training? Yeah, we're good, so you're, you're hanging in there? Okay, uh, so I, I, I will come back to it at the end, but I wanted to just spend a little bit of time telling you about my own contribution to this project, which is um, connected to the first circuit of power that we've isolated, securitization. And um, as you, some of you know and you just heard, I'm an anthropologist, uh, whose field work had for decades uh, been in rural Egypt. With my last book, Do Muslim Women Need Saving, I sort of broadened my work in order to respond directly to the way the subject uh, that had interested me for decades, women in the complexity of their lives and the forms of power they wielded, had been sort of catapulted into public attention with the invasion of Afghanistan and its justification. Uh, in terms of saving the oppressed Muslim woman. I worked with Muslim women for you know, 30 years, and so I didn't see what they saw. So, um, so I worked on that book. Um, uh, but after that, I gradually became aware, and I'll talk tomorrow about how I became aware, uh, of the ways women's rights advocates in the US and Europe were maneuvering to participate, so that was sort of about imperial feminism, but here they, they were maneuvering to participate in the emerging, emergent but fast growing initiatives to counter violent extremism or prevent violent extremism, as it's called, CBE, PBE, soft counter terrorism. Urged by representatives of governments and counter terror think tanks to get in on the ground floor of the architecture 
a surprising number of feminist practitioners, and not just from the global north, have been promoting themselves as uniquely <coughs> to combat extremism and radicalization because of their gender expertise. Some claim first-hand experience with violence by fundamentalists who are not by violent extremists. Um, and to be honest, I was really shocked to find these feminists clamoring for inclusion in the global security enterprise. And I call these feminists Securo feminists. <laughs> Securo feminism can be considered, I think, a strand of what Janet Halley and her colleagues have called governance feminism, which they define broadly as every form in which feminists and feminist ideas exert a governing will within human affairs. Some of this is quote, some is paraphrased, whether through the incorporation into state, state life, and state affiliated power, or well beyond into other public and private governance networks. And if the books haven't arrived here yet, I recommend them truly. There's two volumes that just came out uh, called Governance Feminism. Secure feminists work mostly outside of official military and security sectors. They tend to align themselves with UN women, peace, and security agendas, or women's human rights work, even. And my chapter takes on the twin premises of, premises of secure feminism. It's embrace of what I call phantom of violent extremism, undefined, undefinable, uh, and its self-justifying deployment of the truism that violent extremists are the main perpetrators of extreme forms of gender-based <coughs> violence. This is why we need to mobilize all forms of force to fight them. Grassroots human rights advocates and even some gender policy experts who work closely with the institutions of international and state power have cautioned about the risks of engagement with security. And critical scholars of international human rights law, uh, as well as sociologists and anthropologists, of course, attuned to the dangers of the traffic between policy worlds and academia have been even more insistent. <coughs> Yet their critiques don't seem to have had much traction. Um, from examining the literature, I can offer, offer a few reasons uh, for this. CBE is attractive because it <coughs> opens up opportunities for influencing policy, for bolstering careers, for attracting much needed funding for NGOs. CBE fits comfortably with the long-standing hostility many feminists have toward religion, and especially Islam. Liberal or carceral politics and feminism, which now dominate in certain circles, align fairly easily also with securitization, since they argue for criminalization. So the attraction uh, can't be doubted. And it's apparent in the exponential growth of the number and type of feminist <coughs> groups engaging CBE. Four years ago, a study I ran across, yeah, yeah, four years ago, a study compiled a staggering list of 58 initiatives or networks working on women and CBE with clever acronyms like AWARE, I CAN, SAVE, RESOLVE, WARN, COVER, FATE, and BRAVE. That's all caps, right? Uh, conferences and summits, reports and policy briefs, uh, toolkits and exercises have proliferated, and the shared vocabularies revealed participation of sophisticated gender experts. The reports borrow terminology that emerged from gender frameworks of development and good governance, buzzwords like gender sensitivity, gender mainstreaming, gender inclusivity, empowerment, resilience, and the human rights of women and girls. What caught my attention halfway into my research was something a little bit different, was, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about how the feminists um, create this um, understanding of the sources of violence. But what caught my attention uh, halfway into my research was the way questions of women and CDE <coughs> come together in a puzzle that had confounded a lot of the secure feminists who had taken such great pains to represent extremists, read men, as the evil enemies of women. <coughs> women had been presented as the targets of extremists to justify feminist work and to bolster their credentials as important allies in countering extremism. But a story on the website of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in 2017 asked, 
Why is it so crucial that we apply a gender analysis when shaping our response to violent extremism? The ominous new answer given by the president of Women in International Security, uh, which is one of these groups, was that the pool of potential terrorists is no longer just angry young men. A new specter has emerged on the scene. This is the non-innocent Muslim woman. The women who voluntarily migrated into Syria and Iraq to join ISIS. So no more Muslim exclusion for women. No longer do we need to save them. We need to save ourselves from them. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk more tomorrow about this new inclusion of Muslim women in the terror threat and how it's handled and represented. But for today, um, I just want to conclude my lecture by returning uh, to the troubling question that has haunted our project from the start. How are we to write about the participation of feminist and queer activists and theorists who genuinely care about violence against women, or more broadly, any form of violence on the basis of gender or sexuality in these three interconnected matrices of power that we see as defining our contemporary world. Global securitization around counterterrorism and conflict to rep repressive states and regimes that inflict <coughs> or incite gender violence to intimidate or suppress democratic inclusion, and three, the hidden and not so hidden violences of humanitarian governance. Janet Halley, in, again, in her ambivalent analysis of the emergence of governance feminism, defined as the varieties of feminism and feminists who've entered into and worked with uh, institutions of power, national or international, she and her colleagues uh, identified what they call the five C's that such alignments with power risk. Collaboration, compromise, collusion, complicity, and co-optation. Our explorations of the invocation of the master categories of the AWGBP in three deadly constellations of power have been oriented slightly differently, and we're trying to identify the dynamics of feminist participation in the management of gender violence as these tra categories travel, geographically and across institutions, as they produce transformations in everyday life and political orders, and particularly as they contribute to articulating gender violence in ways that distract from robust and comprehensive analyses of the sources and causes of violence and harm to humans more generally. What we're interested in is in rethinking how we should care about the violence around us and how feminists might best pursue our commitments to those most vulnerable to such violence, those most subject to harm. I come back to Nadia Murad. She suffered terrible, despicable harms. We must not minimize the forms, the form of violence to which she was subjected. Yet every violence inflicted on human beings should disturb us. It also took courage for this young woman to come forward about what was done to her. But even she keeps trying to insist that what happened to her was part of something larger, a collective genocide of her community. That's why she's come forward. That's what she wants condemned. And similarly, uh, if you remember back, Malala Yousafzai insisted on talking to President Obama. I don't know if any of you saw the video of Nadia Murad trying to talk to Trump. He had no idea who she was. But anyway, uh, uh, anyway, uh, Malala uh, insisted on talking to President Obama about drone attacks in Pakistan, not just the education of girls. But when their causes were taken up, gendered violence was isolated and made into the sign and proof of the special, special pathology of Muslims, not just extremists. So how can we respect the harms such women experience as women while refusing the mani manipulation of their experiences for geopolitical ends? and the loud silences 
on the political ecologies and economies in which the master categories of GBV and BAW travel. That's what we're struggling with in our analyses because politically we're worried about contributing to the current war on Muslims and the ways that state violence and the slow death of economic violence somehow escape scrutiny. Thank you.